All right. Hi, we're trying another new technological feat for our newsletters. I'm going to try to do four or five weeks on collecting photography. And we're going to, this video is an experiment. We'll see if it works. Uh, we could try to write it out as we've been doing. We've done a few PowerPoints. But if this video works, um, it might be the best way to communicate this information to you. What I'll also do in conjunction with these videos, on our website weekly, I will put some close-ups and details of certain things I want to point out. So we'll make some still photographs, we'll post them on the website, as well as I'll post up on what I would consider handouts. If this was a class, um, I would be giving you various handouts and I'll post those on the website as PDFs. So again, it would be Scheinbaum and Russick at photographydealers.com. So to begin, uh, it's almost more of a, a lesson in um, words and knowledge, a glossary of terms, if you will. Um, there's so many things to know about collecting photography. And, you know, the bottom line is that when collecting photographs, we're not just collecting pictures. We're also collecting prints. And the more you know about the prints of a particular artist, the more you'll be able to enhance uh, your collection and get the best quality. There's no generic definition of a fine print in photography. It's really dependent on the photographer. Uh, I said this previously in one of the newsletters that we don't expect to find or define a fine print of Ansel Adams the same way we would define a, print, a fine print by Walker Evans or Diane Arbus. You know, they all have print on different papers, they print different sizes, they print with a different ambiance, if you will. And so it really requires you to know the work of a particular artist, what kind of prints they made, um, what um, sizes they made that image in, and you will find, you know, with various images that you're looking for, there are very many different states of prints you can get. There might be a silver print or a platinum print, there might be a contact print or an enlargement, there might be a special edition that was done on a certain paper. This is kind of why we're doing today's session, and I'm going to try to take you through various different kinds of prints just to give you a, a an idea of some of the language that we use. I'm going to start with the most generic kind of photograph in 20th century photography, and that's what we call a gelatin silver print. Most of the images you will look at, whether it's online or at galleries or museums, are going to be gelatin silver prints. I don't like to say it's a generic print, but I'll say it's the most common kind of print. And so when we call something a gelatin silver print, we're talking about the photograph that has actual particles of silver embedded into the emulsion. And when that piece of photographic paper is exposed um, with a negative, then developed in chemistry, those particles of silver turn black or gray, and it forms your image. So we're talking about silver-based photography, and it's particles of silver that are sensitized to light, that build our photograph. And we'll look at a few. This is a beautiful image by Ansel Adams. Um, he pretty much, all of his work would be considered gelatin silver prints, and again, that's the kind of paper that he used to make his photographs. Uh, Edward Weston, another one of the great 20th century masters, um, primarily used gelatin silver paper to make his prints, he did make some other types of prints, uh, platinum prints, which I'll define in a few minutes. But when we're looking at a lot of the masterwork of the 20th century, we're not only seeing uh, the use of gelatin silver prints, we're also seeing the use of glossy paper, which I don't think I can show you on this video, but the paper itself is shiny, and there are gelatin silver prints where the paper is dull, or what we call matte. We also find that a lot of the prints by the 20th century masters are what we call contact prints, meaning the size of the print is 
basically the size of the negative that was used to make the photograph. So when we talk about a contact print, we're talking about a process where the photographer is taking the negative, laying it directly onto the paper, and then passing light through it. This is why, relatively to contemporary photography, a lot of the master prints that we look at are kind of small to some people, especially new people coming to photography. There's not many people working digitally today, for example, that are making, you know, four by five contact prints. Um, it, maybe it's not the best use of that medium, and I will talk more about digital in a few minutes. This is a contact print, a 4x5 contact print, on gelatin silver paper by the photographer André Kertege. And it's a beautiful image of, um, taken under the Eiffel Tower, as you can see. Another kind of contact print on another kind of paper. This is a photograph by a contemporary photographer named Linda Connor. Linda Connor uses a paper that we call printing out paper. It's still a contact print and one of the signs of a contact print is we actually see the edge of the negative on the print. It's that black line around it. Again, I might take a detail of this and put it on the website, but in the case of Ansel Adams and Edward Weston and Kertes, they actually trimmed that off before they mounted their photograph. Linda Kana leaves that negative margin on, so you can see it's a contact print. It's also on a paper that we call printing out paper, and you see it kind of, I don't know if you could tell, it's kind of an eggplanty color, and that's the characteristic of this paper. So besides contact prints on gelatin silver paper, we also can make enlargements. Here's an Elliot Porter photograph was taken here in New Mexico. Now this is where we, the negative is placed into an enlarger and it is enlarged. So there's two options. You know, uh, Ansel Adams, as you may or may not know, this image of Ansel's also exists in larger sizes. There's the contact print and then there are enlargements that he made. So it's two different sizes. He has an Elliot Porter. He also made this image as a contact print, which would be 8 by 10, or he also made it available larger. So when you're looking for a particular image, that's a consideration you'd want, to see what sizes was this available in, and depending on your eye, maybe your space or your aesthetic, you might want a larger version or a smaller version. Not all photographers made prints available in different sizes. Some photographers felt there's only one size for that image and that's the only size they'll do it. Other photographers felt it worked well in various sizes. Depends on the photographer, it depends on what their decision was at the time that they made it. So within the context of gelatin silver prints, we also have other varieties. I mentioned that there's surface differences, but depending on chemistry that you use, depending on your technique in the darkroom, you might want to exaggerate contrast. This is an Italian photographer, uh, Giacomelli. What was his first name? Any of us know? Mario. Mario Giacomelli. This is a high, what we might say is a high contrast print. It's still a gelatin silver print, it's still on glossy paper, but it's very different palette, a very different feeling. Another photographer that kind of exaggerated contrast for his aesthetic is Farr, Louis Farr, who did this beautiful image of these vehicles. Very high contrast. Again, the video may not be best at showing you these examples um, after we make this tape. I'll view the video of certain things that don't come across. I'll make still photographs of and I will post them on our website. So don't despair if you can't see. Another way we refer to gelatin silver prints is the actual tonality of the paper itself. 
This is a photograph by a photographer named Lynn Gieseman. Now this is a matte print. I don't know if you can see that in the video, but it's also on a different kind of gelatin silver paper. It's a warm tone print. This is a print on a piece of paper that we refer to as a cold tone print. So again, there's size differences in gelatin silver, there's surface differences, but the paper itself, and I think this might be best seen, I don't know if you can see this in the video, but the paper base itself, the paper that the emulsion is coated on, whether it's coated on an off-white paper, or if it's coated on a bright white paper, that has all to do with the overall palette that we achieve in the print itself. And, you know, and that's not to ignore the chemistry that we use, which also has a lot to do with palette. So again, another question to ask when you're looking at prints and looking at work is, you know, some photographers printed their image on both warm tone and cold tone paper. It's up to you, the collector, to decide which one you prefer, which version you prefer. Over time, photographers have changed, sometimes changed their opinion. What they liked in the 1920s, they might have liked better a different way in the 1950s or the 1960s. Now, right at the turn of the century, we see another major movement in looking at prints in photography. And this is a, a process that's actually um, not, it's a photographic process, but it's not a chemical process. It's what we call a photomechanical process. This is called a photogravure. It was um, not pioneered, but it was promoted by Alfred Stieglitz and the photographers of the photo secession in a magazine called Camera Work. And in some cases, the photogravure was considered a photographic reproduction. There was an original silver print, or a platinum print, which I'll talk about in a minute, or there was what we called a gravure. And a gravure, and this is an actual page out of the Camera Work magazine, and for all practical purposes, a gravure is a traditional art print. It's a print like an etching would be made. Uh, from the original photographic negative, a metal plate is made. The plate is immersed into acid. The image is bit into the plate, and then the plate is inked, and these gravures are printed one at a time. So because the ink is put on by hand, and the printing is done through a press one at a time, there is a variation in the tonalities of the gravures. So for some people, they chose to use the gravure process for very high quality reproductions of their photographs. But there are examples in the history of photography where the gravure is the final print itself, that the only way the print was made was as a gravure. And some artists preferred this process to a what we might say a silver process or a me other metal process. So this is a uh, Clarence White uh, photogravure from camera work. You've seen other gravures, um, certainly in the Southwest, a very popular photographer is uh, Edward Curtis. He also, um, he had prints available in silver. He had prints available as platinum prints. He had prints available as something we call orotone prints. They're like golden prints on glass. But the most popular Curtis prints that you see at galleries or exhibits would be prints as a photogravure, which is a process that he liked very, very much. And the photographer Paul Strand himself, um, he did a portfolio of images from Mexico. Um, and the edition was a photogravure edition. This is a photogravure print from the Paul Strand Mexican portfolio. And again, he was a protege of Stieglitz. He, of course, makes sense that he was very familiar with the gravure process. And when it came time for him to make an edition, he made, I believe, a hundred 
portfolios of these Mexican images, he chose the gravure process rather than to go into the dark room and make a hundred of every single picture that's in that portfolio. And I think there's like 22 images in that portfolio. So and you could see it's printed on what we might consider more printmaking paper. So we have silver prints, we have gravure prints. Other metals can be used to make photographs as well. I've mentioned probably two or three times already uh, the platinum process. This is a platinum print by photographer Yumiko Izu. She's a master printer. You'll see a platinum print again. I don't know if you can see in the video, but it has a very different palette. But unlike gelatin silver paper, which was always made commercially, meaning one can go kind of to the camera store and buy the paper, of course the photographer would have to say what surface do they want, glossy or matte, what size do they want, various sizes. But people who print platinum, they actually have to coat the emulsion on the paper themselves. So you actually requires the photographer to also have a great knowledge of chemistry. One has to go into the darkroom, coat the paper with the emulsion, let it dry, then make a contact print right onto the platinum. One of the things we admire about platinum is it's able to record much more detail than what we call the low end, much more detail than the blacks, in the shadows, than silver. So we're in a silver print, a shadow might look black, in a platinum print the shadow might have a little detail in it and you might be able to kind of enter those shadows. So people love the ability of platinum to get that extra detail. They also love the overall palette of platinum. Also, because the photographer is coating the emulsion themselves, it gives them a choice of kind of what color paper base to coat on. Should it be a bright white paper, or an off-white paper, or a creamy looking paper? All of that is a variable that changes the characteristic of the print. So again, instead of using silver to be sensitive to light, we could now have a metal of platinum that could be sensitive to light. Another print I have here by Yumiko Izu is what we call a cyanotype. And what a cyanotype is, is instead of using silver metals or platinum metals, we now are using iron metals. And iron gives us this beautiful blue saturation. But again, if I lift the mat on here, you'll see it's a contact print. You'll see the edge of her negative. But you can also see, again, this had to be hand-coated in the darkroom on her chosen color paper and then contact printed onto this surface. So cyanotypes, which actually was invented pre-photography by a man named Sir John Herschel, and I did a whole newsletter on Sir John Herschel, you can look at our website, about the use of this process. So, a lot to consider. So I just picked one photographer to look at really quickly. To, this happens to be a great photographer from New Mexico, well actually from Colorado Springs, but Laura Gilpin made all kinds of prints. She printed in silver, she printed in platinum, she printed in palladium, she printed on warm tone paper, she printed on cold tone paper, she printed on glossy paper, she printed on matte paper. These are considerations the photographers need to make depending on the image. So it's not many photographers were so well versed in process, but this was a beautiful vintage platinum print by Laura Gilpin, and you could see the palette of platinum. You could also see this was taken very early, it's very pictorial in nature, and that soft focus is very much related to her teachers in New York, Clarence White, at the Clarence White School of Photography. Here's a warm tone print, it's a silver print, 
It might be mistaken for platinum because it's very brown, it's very warm looking, but this is a silver print on what we call a warm tone paper, so a very cream colored paper base. And this is a later print, I'm going to see if I can hold all three of these up at the same time. This is a later print of a Tsuki Pueblo Potter, and it's a cold tone gelatin silver print. So, let me see if I could position myself where you could see, you know, one photographer's work who's working, and that's a gelatin silver cold tone print on glossy paper. This is a beautiful vintage platinum palladium print. And this is a mid-century warm tone matte print. So you can see how the palette changes the way you can appreciate an image. The tonality changes the way you appreciate an image. And if this was the same picture, I could assure you all three would be making a very different statement to you. They, the cold brings a certain characteristics to the image, the warmness brings certain characteristics to the image. Still talking about prints, black and white prints, gelatin silver, there's other things that affect the quality, other darkroom kind of processes. Now this is a Cold tone gelatin silver print. So this photograph by Bernard Plassou is a gelatin silver print, just like many of the others we looked at, but you'll see it has a very different palette. It's brown and white instead of black and white. It's what we call sepia toned. So this is done in the darkroom as an after process. The paper is exposed, it's developed in the chemistry just like many of the other prints we looked at. But after the image is developed, it's then immersed into another bath with other metals and those metals actually f attach themselves to the silver and form a new compound, therefore changing the color. Sepia toning makes our images brown and white. We could make prints blue and white, white uh, orange and white, red and white, purple and white. You know, if you know your chemistry, you could actually play with that silver emulsion in many ways. Bernard Plassou's early photography um, is pretty much all sepia toned. It was kind of a signature look of his work. So again, um, it's a gelatin silver glossy print and it's now brown and white. And again, I could assure you, and this is kind of one of my photographs, but I'm just showing it to you. Originally, it was a cold toned black and white print just like this. It was black and white, it was on a paper like this. But if I took this print and immersed it into the toning bath, everywhere it's black and gray would be brown. And, and it's kind of a dark brown and mid-brown. Another after process that's not popular but done often, and this is another one of my photographs and I just couldn't find other examples, is what we call split toning. And this is done by changing the dilution of the toners, changing the temperatures of those toners. And you'll see this, for all practical purposes, three quarters of this photograph is still a black and white photograph. But then there's an introduction of color in this one area, which is the gray area. So we call this split toning. It's black, white, and another color. The master of split toning is a photographer named Olivia Parker. And I was afraid that her work was a little too subtle to show in, in the video like this. Um, but if you're really fascinated by the notion of split toning, I would definitely look at the work of Olivia Parker. And he, she, she just is so masterful at it. Moving on, and maybe before I move on, it just as a quick recap. So when thinking about you know, black and white prints, there's, you know, there's the surface to consider, the size to consider, the palette to consider, the chemistry that was used to consider. Is it a gelatin silver print? Is it a platinum print? Is it a cyanotype? Is it split tone? At what size is it? Is it a contact print? Is it an enlargement? All of these things are important to know as you develop your connoisseurship about collecting. Some photographers made the same image in a variety of ways. 
Some photographers only made it one way. But when you find a, an image that you're interested in, it kind of behooves you to study that photographer's work. How else is this image available? What are the sizes? What are the tonalities? And of course you choose the one that you prefer, that you like best. Moving to color, the like gelatin silver, the most popular color process in the 20th century, and this is another image by the photographer Lynn Giesemann, is what we call a type C print. And a type C print is an emulsion on the photographic paper where the dyes are already impregnated into the emulsion. So simply what the photographer is doing when they're printing is they're exposing the paper, developing it, and they're releasing the dyes that are already in that emulsion. Different manufacturers, the dyes have different characteristics. If people print it on Kodak paper or Ilford paper or Fuji paper, they would, some would be redder, some would be bluer, some would be warmer, some would be colder. So the photographer chooses the brand of paper, but the Type C print is a look and a process that is probably most popular in the 20th centuries. I will say that Type C prints are not very permanent. They have a life of 10 to 25 years depending on how you store it. Is it behind ultraviolet plexiglass? Has it been in a box? Has it been exposed to fluorescent light or sunlight? These are concerns that you have and we will have a session on conservation where I'll talk about that more in depth. Another process that wasn't invented by Elliot Porter but promoted by Elliot Porter was this process we call dye transfer process. Now Kodak originally developed the dye transfer process from Madison Avenue. It was a process where the photographer was able to control the saturation of the colors. It's a very involved uh, darkroom process of taking your original transparency making color separations, then taking those color separations and making matrices, and then soaking those matrices in dye baths, and then applying that matrix to a blank piece of paper and letting the paper absorb the dye. And that's where this notion of dye transfer. The dye is being transferred from a, almost like a sponge-like film on, into the emulsion of the paper. Cyan, magenta, yellow, different printings in perfect succession and perfect registration. It gave the photographer control over the kind of look, the saturation that they wanted. Sometimes you want to make yellow more yellow without the blue turning green. So it, because you're printing each color separate, you were able to control your separate saturation. The transfer prints are also relatively permanent. Um, at least to a hundred years. So Elliot Porter's work, uh, the father of color photography, his prints are absolutely magnificent and in beautiful registration. Again, you have to realize that three different pieces of film were put on this, one in a, after each other, and yet the sharpness and the clarity is exquisite, as well as the color. It just makes it almost three-dimensional in looking at it. Another color process is very obscure. I have come back to the photographer Bernard Plissou. But this is a very obscure process, but because I had an example, I wanted to put it in. This is called a Fresson print. And Fresson is a, was a, is a French family that came up with this proprietary process, a secret process. We know that the prints are very, very permanent, and we know that they use organic pigment, natural pigments. I can't tell you exactly how the prints are made. I know it's a similar technique to the dye transfer, which require, you know, the complexity of building up the color. But this has a very different look. It, there, the paper itself is a matte paper. The color is very pastel-like, very soft, very muted. Not every picture looks great as a Fresson print, but when you get it, and this is a great example of a beautiful press-on print. You know, this image just sings and creates a mood 
that you can see it's a very different mood from a dye transfer print and of course from a type C print. You see it's a very different feeling, a very different look. Another way to achieve color, and you might come upon this, there's not many people doing this anymore, but from the very beginnings of photography, meaning from the very beginnings of the invention of the daguerreotype, people were hand coloring. I don't know if you've ever seen early daguerreotypes or early tintypes. People were, photographers were putting a little rouge on the cheeks just to make them look more lifelike. That was the beginning of hand coloring. This is a, I used to be into a lot of hand coloring. This, again, you can see it's a black and white print, but by using uh, very specific oils, they're kind of, uh, well, they're oils that are made for hand coloring. They're kind of translucent almost. You'll see, I just went over the black and white print and I just, by hand, colored this area. So, you might see a print that has a very different look. It might be hand colored. So, again, looking at a color print, is it a type C print? Is it a dye transfer print? Is it a frisson? Is it hand colored? There's carbro, there's many other ways that color was applied in the 20th century and late 19th century to photographs. And to end today, um, at one of Janet's photographs, we have digital technology. And digital technology brings us right to the 21st century. Um, depend, regardless of the name, most of the various names that people attach to the uh, digital prints have more to do with the actual dyes that are used. A majority, or let's say a generic digital print today is what we call inkjet prints. There's another kind I'll talk about in a minute, but an inkjet print is depending on the print to use and depending on the inks, we're actually spraying ink onto the paper. So, again, unlike the Type C print, where the dye, the color, is in the paper itself, when we're making an inkjet print, we're spraying through the nozzles in those digital printers, we're spraying the color onto the paper, and if it's a good quality paper, we call it archival paper, the paper is accepting those dyes, and of course then the image is drying onto that paper. So, there's a lot of names for inkjet prints, but as I said, most of them are inkjet. They're very permanent, but not all. It depends on the inks themselves. So, you'll see labels in museums or galleries like archival inkjet print, so you know that the dyes, the color itself, is an archival ink. It's an ink that has a very, very long life. You also would want to make sure it's on a acid-free, a very high-quality paper. But if the paper itself has no acid in it to change the color of it, and the inks are permanent, the digital prints are very, very permanent, and they give the photographers a lot of control. And if we go back to the beginning of this talk, you know, as I said, many of the 20th century photographers were making contact prints. It was felt for many, many years as photography was developing into the art form that it is, that the highest quality image one could make was to make a print the same size of, as the negative. So if a print was 4x5, the negative was 4x5. If the print was 8x10, the negative was 8x10. If the print was 11x14, like that Yumiko Izu cyanotype, then the negative was 11x14, which of course is a very, very large camera, but it was felt because of the quality that if you didn't enlarge it, you're getting your sharpest, clearest picture. So that's why so many 20th century masterworks are so small. But now, in the 21st century, digital permits us to go as big as this room and not lose any quality. So the, the great advance of digital is that it's kind of liberated the photographers in terms of size. They could, we could make prints any size now and not lose any quality like we kind of did in analog. Um, there is another kind of digital print family. There's the inkjet, which I said is probably the most common. There are 
and again, many different names, but it's something called light jet, where the digital prints are actually exposed with a laser beam in a dark room. So imagine taking a, a piece of type C paper, this paper that has the dye already in it, and exposing it with a laser in the dark room, and then processing it in wet chemistry. So digital prints can be made with this other process, which we call light jet. But again, there's a lot of proprietary names. But I keep coming back to this. Inkjet is going to be kind of your most popular. So again, if you've watched this video, um, it's a one grand experiment. You know, I'm not sure you're able to see everything I'm talking about, but we're going to try to supplement this video on our website, which is photographydealers.com. And if you look under the tab that says History of Photography, we have all our newsletters posted there. But for this particular one, um, which I don't know what we'll name, probably something like processes or terms. I'm going to put some detailed photographs of some of the prints we looked at today. I'm going to put some handouts and I'll put with warm tone and cold tone, I'll try to put some side-by-side -side pictures for you so you'll be able to really study some of the things I was trying to bring to you today. So again, we'll continue this little collector series for four or five weeks. Please let us know, give us some feedback. Um, let us know, you know, what you, if this is distracting, if this is a good way to communicate this information to you. Um, I could go back and try to write it all out. Um, we're trying to, you know, share our passion with you, and so we want it to be the way you want it as well. So let us hear from you. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you again next week.